Hello and welcome to another meeting of DiEM25's uh, Coordinating Collective. As every week, we are going to discuss Europe's burning issues. Um, but before we do that today, we've got a special guest. We've got David Adler from the Progressive International, uh, our sister organization, who has, was recently representing the Progressive International in Ecuador and has updates for us on, on what's happening there. So we'll kick off with David and then we'll move to burning issues. Let's go, David. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Excited. Lovely to be with you all. You know, the PI's motivating force has always been to make solidarity more than a slogan, trying to think of the ways that we can make this internationalism feel real in people's lives and move from a kind of symbolic mode to one that is really substantive. And to do that work, you know, this uh, electoral observatory has kind of come into formation by necessity rather than by design. So being called to action in Bolivia to go protect democracy there, and indeed being called to action in Ecuador, uh, as many of you may have seen with, a, with the increasing and escalating risk of a soft coup. Um, the situation in Ecuador is, uh, for lack of a better word, completely and totally absurd. Uh, if you've not been following this, this particular strain of absurdity, uh, the Progressive International is being accused of facilitating through its virtual summit alone between the National Liberation Army, the guerrillas uh, in the jungles of Colombia, and uh, the presidential candidate Andres Arauz, even though the video in which they're shown with their Kalashnikovs firing into the air saying, we support Comrade Arauz has been debunked by linguists as well as ornithologists who have identified the bird sounds as being not even remotely part of the Colombian uh, natural landscape, but actually either in Northern Peru or in Ecuador itself. And yet, despite this absurdity, um, uh, when I was there, the last day I was there, the general attorney of uh, Colombia flew uh, with all the pomp and circumstance of a diplomatic visit from Colombia to the capital Quito to meet with the Fiscalia there and present a stack of documents and laptops uh, that were supposedly recovered from a dead soldier uh, very conveniently to indicate on that laptop in some secret files that indeed this loan had taken place. So the situation in Ecuador is uh, basically one of desperation, I think on behalf of the reactionary right, they're uh, throwing everything against the wall and seeing what sticks. Uh, and what's critical, I think from the position of, uh, of Diem uh, with activists across Europe and Progressive International more broadly is that the same conversation we had all across the country throughout our stay there that this solidarity has been critical, that the attention uh, that of the international community to these issues, bringing that kind of transparency and vigilance has been essential to preserving the integrity of the elections. And we've won a sustained set of victories. I mean, the work that we've done together uh, between PI and DM has been, uh, from all accounts we have for people on the ground, just really essential in swinging very narrow votes to, you know, to push Andres Arauz, for example, off the ballot, you know, in criminalizing the opposition and a range of legal warfare tactics. So this has not, this is not going to stop, but, um, but our delegation was, uh, um, you know, we were, we were making real headwinds in trying to deepen our relationships there, build, build out, you know, what the PI can mean to Ecuadorians on the ground uh, and play a real role uh, that we think we can learn a lot from this in terms of the construction towards this broader electoral observatory. Um, and of course, election observation is the kind of feels like a weak instrument um, insofar as, you know, we're kind of observing elections, walking around with, uh, with little um, clipboards but actually it does provide a lot of capacity. And one of the things we learned in Ecuador is we brought with us a technical team, which is something we didn't have in Bolivia. So we had you know, data analysts, uh, election, uh, real election data scientists who were able to give us you know, real time proper analysis that matched up almost to the exact vote count at the end uh, of the first round. Uh, and that learning that that technical capacity, especially in a place like Ecuador, where there are these baseless claims of fraud that are lobbied against uh, specific candidates as a, as a vehicle for their expulsion, or um, in the case of Bolivia, grounds for their uh, you know, exile and criminalization, that this is really, really critical. So this kind of mode of sort of, if you, if you can forgive the phrase, brigade-like mobilization, where we're bringing people from around the world to be present for these elections has been really, um, rewarding and I think a, a, a key piece of this PI work and it's something that we should discuss together about, you know, what, what are those key terrains and not enough, not going there just because we think we should be there, but going there because people on the ground are asking us to be there, you know, we're being asked by our members to be to be present uh, and vigilant in defense of democratic institutions. So that's really exciting. And I think the other update that just feels really present to, to the particular moment is that as we sit here, uh, preparations for the G20 uh, finance 
uh, the sort of the finance ministers are, are, of the G20 are preparing to meet to um, to prepare a common framework for the global debt crisis. Uh, and you know, by any reasonable assessment, the framework that they've put on the table is uh, not a framework for for resolving this debt crisis, but rather a kind of debtor's prison for the go the governments of the global south that are being asked to swallow it. Um, they are committing uh, Yanis's uh, cardinal sin of mistaking a crisis of insolvency for a crisis of liquidity. And uh, threatening to basically delay and you know continue forever onward a system in which so many countries are paying more to service their international debts than they are paying for healthcare. So our debt justice collective, which has convened scholars and practitioners ranging from people working on debt imprisonment in Sierra Leone to academics like Jayati Ghosh, a friend of the M25s, are working together to kind of think put forward a kind of alternative set of proposals for you know what needs to go in this many of which are reflected uh you know in in the, the work that that dm25 has been doing on, at the european level um and thinking through these questions of sovereign debt um but what's critical is that this is a very lonely voice um you know uh, the, the g20 like many of these very powerful multilateral institutions, indeed like the Eurogroup for many years, gets away with being a kind of depoliticized space with not a lot of contention, mass contention and sort of democratic uh, contestation. And uh, we see our role uh, speaking across various constituencies with various representatives of, of movements and parties to fill that space uh, and ensure that there is not just transparency, but an alternative vision uh, to kind of contest with that at the G20. So those are two uh, big updates. Uh, you'll forgive the fact that I'm in a, a little hotel room in the middle of nowhere, but um, uh, I'm happy to be with you and um, and to talk a bit more about the work of the PI in the months to come. Thanks, David. Hotel room forgiven. Anyone want to come in? Any updates on PI? Yanis. Well, thanks, David, for this uh, briefing. Uh, quite comprehensive. Uh, Looking at the PI from a distance that you don't have because you are in the belly of the beast, at least organizationally, uh, there are two complementary but separate uh, tasks that the PI has, as I see it. One is solidarity with um, whatever is happening, the struggles that are happening on the ground. So, for instance, the work in Ecuador is a work of solidarity with uh, our comrades in Ecuador struggling to preserve some basic democratic standards and to prevent an election from being stolen, for instance, similarly in Bolivia, similarly in other places. Yeah, this is essential work, but it's only part of the work uh, because besides defending and solidarity, uh, the, the PI must play uh, a leadership role, bringing issues and campaigns to different localities, whether it's Ecuador or Germany or wherever, that would not have, have, have gone there otherwise. Uh, that is the whole point of us working together. Um, and so it seems to me that, you know, given that the PI is um, a very young organization, uh, we're doing the right thing to start with solidarity uh, and gradually uh, build up the leadership role. I see, you know, the discussion that um, is now taking place in which uh, you alluded to regarding debt, the tsunami of debt that's hitting the world, um, particularly private debt for the, the little people, in inverted commas, little people, uh, the, 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 this is um, going to swamp, uh, you know, progressive forces as a huge, huge problem. Uh, both in the developing countries and in the de developed ones. Uh, now, there are so many things to talk about, but I just want to mention one thing, just for the, in, for the, for, for the present context. Uh, we are facing a, ma a major balancing act between not enough radicality and too many delusions radical delusions. Uh, so there is no doubt that some of the members of the, of the PI are rooted in, the, in a tradition which is, is heartwarming, uh, but absolutely um, out of sync with the times regarding their model of, you know, the theory of change and what, what they're talking about. Um, I won't say more, you know what I'm referring to. 
But then there is the danger of too much pragmatism. Uh, the discussion on debt, for instance. And I've been uh, a guilty party to this to some extent because you know, in my struggle as a finance minister and so on to find something that can be done today, um, you know, I was always proposing uh, debt restructuring um, using the existing uh, instruments of uh, the financial markets, which are, you know, the, all these things have their place in what we were doing. But we need to think more long term. We need to think more radically about debt. And we need to think more radically about what we need to do at the global level in order to transcend the current state that we find ourselves in, which some people talk about in terms of globalization. I talk about it in terms of what I call techno feudalism. Right? Um, and one last thought on this, and I'll shut up. Good friends of ours, members of the PI as well, uh, people who whom we, ha we have been working with for a very long time, uh, they have a tendency, and it's quite natural, I have that tendency too, to look back at previous decades, searching for solutions. So for instance, you know, Jamie Galbraith, my great friend, and you know, Diemer from the, you know, from, uh, the University of Texas. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's as a Galbraith, because he's the son of Galbraith. He's imagining a Galbraithian approach to you know, putting the genie in the bottle, the genie being oligarchic power, the power of big business, of corporate businesses. He's imagining a world similar to that in 1945, when you know, the New Deal became international with financiers being constrained through the Bretton Woods process, um, yeah, trust-busting government that um, even threatens the large corporations with uh, nationalization. That's quite natural because it worked back then, at least to some extent. And it's the obvious thing to do today, at least in the mindset of many people. Um, but I don't think that we can look to the past for solutions for the present. Uh, I don't think that the state exists anymore anywhere. Anywhere, not in Ecuador, not in America, not in Germany, not in Greece that can utilize the power of government in order to constrain and civilize corporations. You know that I am, uh, over the last year, um, very uh, keen to discuss ownership of corporations and to discuss or to propose that, to propose, to promote the, the view that we need to rethink share markets. We need to ban share markets. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a huge uh, statement to make, but I will keep making it. Um, I'm turning 60 in a few weeks, and I decided that a, a better campaign on this for the rest of my days, because I think that without that, as long as there exist share markets com well, combined with financial markets, um, we are not going to be able to civilize this beast. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, Srechko. Yeah, maybe just uh, to add something as well to about the Progressive International. Uh, besides what David said, and Yanis, I think one of the biggest updates uh, is that uh, we are going to have an anniversary very soon, in two or three months. Uh, we are refreshing the Council of the Progressive International. And I think geopolitically speaking, you know, I pr you probably heard the news that China just toppled the European Union uh, as the biggest trade partner. Uh, so it's not the US anymore, but China. Looking at what's happening in Serbia, uh, for instance, uh, who are now sixth, uh, sixth in the world when it comes to the vaccine rollout, second in Europe, uh, uh, and now the Croatian government is also talking to China. Uh, you can obviously see that the geopolitics due to the pandemic, but not on, only due to the pandemic, is rapidly shifting and changing. And I think in this world of rapidly shifting geopolitics, the progressive international is crucial and the work the progressive international is doing. Uh, so besides what Yanis is saying that uh, it should focus more on uh, a program, uh, uh, you know, a vision, uh, uh, what could concretely be done and being more present in specific countries, regions. Uh, I also see that the role of the progressive international as filling the absent 
role of an uh, internationalist movement. And I think in one year it has really accomplished a lot, uh, not just by sending observatory delegations to, uh, to, to Bolivia or Ecuador, but by the membership organizations who are joining the um, big Amazon campaign and strike and so on. Uh, so I think that the work is continuing. Uh, but I think we at DM25 should also start thinking about China and the changing geopolitics in Europe itself, because I think in 10 years it will look completely differently. I mean, it's already looking differently. So that's just my addition to this. Thank you, Srechko. We're, we're kind of moving slowly towards burning issues. Maybe we should all mix it. Um, does anyone have any comments on anything that's been said so far or any other burning issues that are happening in the world, really, this week that they'd like to put on the table? Anybody? No? Nothing's happened in the world this week? It's been a quiet week in the world. I must say I watched uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, which is not a world event, but it's a great movie, which I would suggest to everyone, uh, not just about revolution and betrayal, but about the infiltration in progressive movements, uh, which we, <laughs> we had some sorts of experiences with that as well. But sorry, Macron, it's just a proposal for, for our members to watch. Well, that's very good. And film recommendations uh, are also good to fill these awkward Zoom silences while everyone's thinking. Anyone want to go for Europe's burning issues? Um, World's burning may issues? May I ask Carol. about the Maltese journalist who died, uh, who was uh, killed? And uh, today we learned that uh, the, um, some people were arrested or uh, I don't know what happened uh, exactly. But do you know anything about it? Because they are talking about having a just, justice in Malta because of this uh, tragic event. Yanis. Well, it's only what I've read in the newspapers. Uh, the, the, the Maltese government, after years of uh, doing absolutely nothing on purpose, uh, they have announced that uh, they are about to arrest or have arrested all the suspects in the case of the journalists of Galicia. Um, I do not trust the Maltese government. We have to wait and see. Uh, let me inform our, our members who are watching and comrades here that um, there is um, um, uh, another related case. Maria Efimova is um, um, a woman who, is, who lives now in Greece, in particular in Crete, where Mehran is. Uh, and, um, you know, she, she comes from Malta and uh, she's a whistleblower. Her life was threatened, uh, similarly. Uh, and now they are pursuing her husband to have him extradited from Greece to Cyprus. Uh, in effectively, the same mafia that uh, is operating in Malta is operating in Cyprus. And uh, Mera 25, DiEM 25, are engaged in uh, a campaign to save her, to save her husband. Um, the two cases are going side by side. We have lawyers working on this full time. Um, so. We'll uh, keep you up to up to date, uh, Beral. Uh, let's see how this uh, uh, develops. Uh, we had an interesting uh, development this morning. Um, the, the lawyer, the Mera 25, DM 25 lawyer who is uh, working on this case, called me this morning to say that um, the case that she had submitted to Interpol, she had sent a whole case to Interpol on this issue. Uh, our lawyer, that is, sent the case to Interpol in Paris, uh, was informed today by Interpol that the DHL package that she sent to Paris was actually stolen. Um, I have never heard of a DHL package being stolen, especially one that is being sent to Interpol. So something fishy is certainly happening. And, you know, if it moves like fish and smells like fish, it must be fishy. So there you are. But since I have the floor, Mehran, let me um, let me say uh, that as we speak, there is uh, a European Union Council in progress uh, over, of course, 
Zoom or teleconference or some platform. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the complete agenda is, uh, but there is um, one burning issue uh, or one issue that they are discussing, which um, has the capacity to, to, to burn up the whole of Europe. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, the discussion on when is austerity coming back with a vengeance. Uh, in Germany, um, as we know, there is a very serious discussion happening, which is developing into a clash between the SPD and the CDU uh, on something that seems inconsequential, that is the appointment of economists to the Council of Economic Experts. Um, for the first time in the history of the Federal Republic, that SPD is vetoing the CDU appointees and the CDU is vetoing the SPD appointees. Um, usually it's all very consensual. Uh, that shows a number of things. It firstly shows that um, as Merkel is exiting the scene, uh, there is a lot of jostling for position in the CDU, in the SPD. There are the Greens waiting in the wings, ready to join in a coalition government with the CDU. Um, the, uh, and, 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 and it is clear that the, the Berlin establishment uh, are divided amongst themselves regarding austerity. When should austerity hit again Italy, Spain, Greece and France? Yeah? France is crucial. This European Union Council tonight uh, is going to be dancing around these issues. You see, this is a tragedy of Europe. Our great and good leaders get together uh, and they are not allowed to discuss directly that which matters, but they have to dance around it, while behind the scenes, these decisions are being hammered out. So the reason why DiEM25 came into being was be precisely because of this lack of transparency, because there's not even a single forum where decisions are made, where there are minutes, and where we can follow what the hell is happening on our behalf. Okay? Uh, this is getting worse. So um, my view is that, uh, yet again, DiEM25 is more important now than it has ever been in a set of circumstances which makes our activism harder than ever before. Um, you know, we have to operate through Zoom and we have to operate in a, in a world, in a society which is completely and utterly stupefied by a politics that is um, very successful at depoliticizing itself and at not having a direct debate on things that matter. Thank you, Yanis. Judith. I heard that uh, another topic that uh, they're discussing today is uh, the issue of uh, vaccine passports uh, and uh, a perspective uh, for tourism, uh, specifically the issue of how to allow non-EU citizens uh, to start traveling to the EU again. Uh, for example, uh, visitors from the UK, from the USA, from Israel uh, to go on vacation uh, in Southern Europe and uh, we have come out against uh, a vaccine passport because of um, privacy concerns. Um, but I think that um, we as DiEM might want to uh, have a more detailed uh, proposal of how do we reconcile uh, travel and uh, support for the tourism industry uh, in the time of coronavirus. Well, thanks to the, let me, um, Sergio, let me just give you a bit more information on this because I happen to know exactly how this conversation started. Our infinitely wise Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, uh, had this idea of a vac of vaccination passport. It turns out that um, uh, he's not infinitely wise. He's simply a stooge of IATA, the International Association of uh, Airlines. Uh, they gave him the idea. And uh, the Netanyahu government. Um, I have it on good authority that um, uh, this is something that the Israeli government has been pushing for. And indeed, um, the first time that the vaccination passport was mentioned was when Mr. Takis, the Greek Prime Minister, suggested it with a letter to Ursula on the line. Uh, and then, a week later, uh, Mr. Takis and Netanyahu signed an agreement 
uh, to have a vaccination document allowing Israeli citizens to come into Greece with uh, a vaccination certificate uh, so, that, so that we know what is going on. The reason why, I mean, our position, at least the, the position of our party in, in, in the Greek parliament is clear. We are gung-ho in favor of vaccinations. The more, the better, and the faster, the better. And any delay in vaccinating people is creating uh, circumstances for new strands of the, of the virus to come up. Already, the EU's uh, fiasco has uh, imperiled uh, millions of people because the more we delay, uh, the, the more the mutations of the virus and the harder it will be to contain it. So we are completely in favor of, of a proper vaccination program, but we are adamant against the vaccination passport uh, for a number of reasons, uh, you did, not just the privacy issue. Of course, the privacy issue, because the moment they, you have a, any kind of certificate, electronic or paper-based, which uh, you have to, you have to, to show as to what you put into your body and what's inside your body, um, then um, how can you stop employers from using it? How can you stop it from, from it being used, uh, not just regarding COVID-19, but COVID-20? I'm, I'm, I'm making it up, the next COVID, the next virus, the next bug, right? And then uh, it, it, it's a very slippery slope because once you accept the concept of the vaccination passport, then uh, it's just, um, you know, um, a first step towards allowing corporations and allowing states to demand that citizens carry on them and share with anybody who asks them a complete medical record. It is just, you know, the thin edge of the wedge. Uh, and besides that, um, there is no evidence. I mean, I'm vaccinated and so is uh, Rosemary amongst us. I don't know who else is. Uh, but there is no evidence that I am not a carrier, uh, that I cannot transmit it to other people. So what if I have a vaccination passport? Um, I could, you know, go to Liberia and, uh, you know, kill hundreds and thousands of people for all, for all I know. Um, maybe, maybe I'm not a carrier, but we don't have the, the, the trials yet for that. There's some evidence that um, the Pfizer vaccine is, is working this way, but we don't know that. Um, and, uh, uh, but in any case, I think we should be very steadfast on that um, to the extent that medical records must never be uh, produced at the behest of authority, whether it's private or public, we must fight against vaccination passports and as for, and that's how I finish uh, it. how do we help the tourist um, industries of the Southern, of Euro Southern Europe? We don't. It is really very simple. Stuff the tourist industry. We cannot have exceptions that jeopardize public health in order to save hotels and car rentals. Thank you, Claudia, and then Srechko. Yeah, thank you for that dis discussion. And as you all know, we have this article on our website, Free the Vaccines for All, and uh, we are still uh, growing the campaign, um, making plans and um, having the objective to raise awareness of the possibility to produce and distribute much larger quantity of the vaccines. Because if the vaccine formula is shared and therefore decreases the pandemic's mortality rate within the EU, EU and abroad, it's very important that we think also on the global south on that um, issue. And I'm very happy that um, some people of our press team are involved in this campaign starting. And we had just a presentation on the Green New Deal call before, as Dujan know, he invited us to, to explain a bit what we want to do and how we want to do. And we hope that many people are willing to help us to, to grow this um, very important campaign bigger because it's burning and we need to do it really fast, in fact. So, because also there is a, good idea, as Yanis always mentioned, how we can finance this problem, because this is the same kind of um, financial problem we have with the climate, right? We need money for, for saving the people and the earth, and therefore it's very important that we work on that. So thank you for everybody who wants to join that. Thanks, Claudia. Love the cardboard cutout of Amy Winehouse. Uh, Srechko. 
Yeah, I wanted to add to this topic. Uh, when I hear vaccine passport, uh, it immediately smells of biopolitics. Uh, and you know that uh, Giorgio Agamben, the Italian philosopher, uh, well, became a very controversial figure recently because of his texts uh, on, on COVID-19. Uh, but whatever you think about it, whether you agree with him or not, he still has a good point, I would say. Uh, uh, I would go so far to say that uh, for whatever reason 9-11 happened, whether it was an inside job or not, it doesn't matter. What really matters is the kind of measures that were implemented after 9-11. And I think this is more or less Agamben's point also with COVID-19, although he at the beginning diminished, uh, you know, the seriousness of the virus and so on. Uh, but we are really going into the uh, direction of first class citizens, second class citizens, third class citizens. So to, to, to respond to Judith, uh, my big worry is not so much tourism. And I'm saying this from a country which has the one of the highest uh, 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 parts of the GDP, which goes for tourism in the world, namely Croatia, and is completely fucked without tourism. Uh, but my big worry is not tourism so much, uh, but foreign labor migrant workers you know what about them you know germany needs around 300,000 seasonal workers each year to to pick asparagus strawberries and whatever you know you buy in lidl or spar or hofer or i don't know i don't want to to make further advertisement for all the shopping chains uh, what about these people i have friends relatives who travel to germany have to pay 200 euros because they travel back and forth and so on and no one cares about them you know so in that sense i don't care so much about uh, uh you know the rich people from britain or U united states who will come to the beautiful paradise of global uh, of the global south or southern europe i care more about the workers uh, from romania bulgaria croatia serbia and so on who already have difficulties traveling uh, but that said even though uh, i find any vaccine uh, passport suspicious and very close to biopolitics, uh, I think there are serious problems we have to address. Uh, for instance, in this coordinating collective, uh, we have a member, that's me, uh, who, who, who is uh, in Croatia at the moment, and we have another member who is in Serbia at the moment, uh, Ivana. And Dusan, but Dusan is not there, I think. But anyhow, so if Ivana wants to travel from Serbia to Croatia, although she is hypothetically vaccinated, for instance, uh, because Serbia got 1 million or almost 2 million doses from China. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you operate this system so that she doesn't have to make a test in Serbia and in Croatia and pay 200 euros, for instance? Uh, uh, I understand what Yanis is saying. Maybe there is no sufficient uh, evidence that they are not transmitters and so on. But at one point, this question will really become a question. Uh, uh, and it is already a question. But as Claudia said, I think this is nothing compared to the problems the Global South is facing. Because 10 countries in the world have administered 75% of all the vaccines in the world, while we in Europe have these big problems how we will travel from one country to the other country. Uh, so I think our focus should be foreign workers, migrant labor inside of the EU uh, uh, and Global South. But slowly we should also think what are the other ways if there is no vaccine passport, maybe that's a question for Yanis, how to solve this problem so that people can travel easier and, you know, they are not discriminated on the border uh, 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 and so on. So maybe that's a question we should deal with. Thanks, Rechko. Uh, let's go to that Serbian member, Ivana. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, uh, since Rechko mentioned um, the amount of vaccines in Serbia, it might sound really cool, but uh, it's uh, very confusing here because there is one portion of Chinese vaccines. People are not sure from which circle of testing. Is it second? It, was it tested in Turkey first and then we got it? Um, there is one portion of uh, Russian vaccines and they're supposedly going to be manufactured in Belgrade. And um, then there is a word on the street that us from non-EU countries will not be able to enter EU countries, even though we were vaccinated with, for example, Chinese uh, vaccine. So it's very confusing. And uh, although the propaganda from our government uh, looks very good, it also has some consequences and some um, you know you you get some, you lose some, and the colonization of uh, these countries of Serbia and uh, the neighborhood is something very evident. 
And when we are talking, for example, for uh, and you mentioned Srechko 9th, 11th, and I remember when the lockdown started that we were saying in our Beyond the Balconies and PMTV uh, that what happened with airports after 9th, 11th will happen to the society, to, to the whole world after these pandemics. And one thing is implementing technological achievements for our protection, and the other thing is um, total surveillance, having uh, passports, uh, vaccines, your personal health data exposed. I mean, what will be private if your health data is uh, out there? And uh, this is something that we should take care. When you look at it, Serbia implemented, I mean, installed 3,000 smart cameras from China before the lockdown. Now we will have uh, Chinese vaccines. And, you know, it's, it's the market. It's, I don't see this as a very good example of international collaboration, for example. So, and yeah, I would neither. recommend to everybody to watch the interview that Mehran had last night for uh, DMTV, uh, where Ricky is talking about all the myths and all the things that we as DM uh, should uh, talk about and expose, and uh, the outbursts in schools and so on, and who, how transmission is going on without us knowing about it. And tourism and vacations are. Sorry, but first world problem, uh, in my view. Thanks, Ivana. Just talking there about uh, our, our interview yesterday with a grassroots activist who's fighting to eliminate COVID. You can find that on our YouTube channel. And likewise, if you're out there and you've got questions uh, on this topic or other things that we're discussing, please pop them in the chat and I might read them out between the interventions. Srechko. Just, just very quickly, I mean, Ivana is completely right what she's saying. I also heard from some friends in Serbia and we, what, what kind of concessions China or Russia is getting already, either connected to the One Belt, One Road, or uh, 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 building factories in Vojvodina, for instance, uh, uh, and so on. And that's a serious concern. But on the other side, if you look at the UK, for instance, United Kingdom, you can see the penetration of Silicon Valley companies like Palantir, Peter Thiel, uh, uh, who is very close to the deep state in the United States, into the NHS. Uh, so in that way, the, the health data in the so-called developed West is already privatized. It's already part of big tech. Uh, uh, so I think we are in a situation where we have to choose, you know, whether you choose the Silicon Valley West, penetrating, privatizing your healthcare systems, or you will choose uh, uh, Chinese surveillance like Huawei or Russian gas, uh, like in the, in the case of Serbia. And it's, well... Both choices are, are, are bad. I would say we have to find a third option. We don't have it yet. Uh, uh, if we had the non-aligned movement where our countries were uh, crucial, uh, maybe we would cooperate with Cuba now, which is producing 100, at least they announced to produce 100 million doses of vaccine until the end of the year. And each tourist would probably also get vaccinated when they come to Cuba. But that's not our situation. So I think we in the Balkans, and I shut up here, have to confront our reality uh, uh, and deal with the geopolitics which actually already exists in our in our close neighborhood, which is China, Russia, United Arab Emirates, and so on. And sometimes it's not necessarily worse than the EU. That's what I have to say. Uh, there's a question from the chat. Would the members of the panel support nation state or EU level mass purchases of the Sputnik V vaccine to be used in EU member states should the EMA declare it medically safe to use? That's the Russian developed vaccine. Anyone? Let me answer if I may. Yes. Not so much the, the, the specifics. Look, we are not a scientific committee here. We are a, a coordinating collective. We're not going to start choosing and picking between different vaccines. Uh, the geopolitics of vaccination uh, we're always going to, to be very powerful because you know, we have a whole planet effectively on hold. So, you know, uh, as if they're not going to use the geopolitical power that the vaccine, vaccines are uh, uh, providing. But we must, you know, not rush into, um, you know, complicated theories. I think that Occam's razor is the best uh, guide here. In other words, let's keep it, keep it simple. Uh, there is no doubt that, um, oops, have I frozen? No, I haven't. Uh, there is no doubt that governments are playing fast and loose with their geopolitics. Uh, Emmanuel Macron came out 
the other day and um, dismissed AstraZeneca's uh, um, vaccine uh, simply because he's playing a stupid little game on Brexit. And the result is that the, the French are not interested and a lot of the Germans are, don't want to take an AstraZeneca because of the spat between AstraZeneca and, 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 and Macron and, and Brussels, which has created, uh, a, you know, a lot of disinformation about one particular vaccine due to just politics, nothing more than that. Um, regarding the Chinese vaccines. Look, Sretzko, I have a view on Chinese geopolitical soft power peddling. Uh, they are a force to be reckoned with, and we have to be very, very uh, skeptical of all power, Chinese power included. But judging by the, 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 the Belt and Road Initiative and so on, uh, and now their policy with vaccination, uh, they're infinitely preferable to anything that the United States and the EU have ever done. Their policy is really very simple. We are giving you the vaccines for free, okay, to carry favor, to carry favor. No strings attached. That is the Chinese policy. In the same way that they went to Ethiopia in the year 2003 and built a whole new airport and a whole electrification network, as well as a, te te a telephony system, for, for nothing. There were, there, were no strings, there were no strings attached. I know that. Of course, what, what happened later, when they discovered some oil in the south of Ethiopia, right? Chinese companies were given preferential trip, treatment, which is, you know, this, this is how they work. Um, is this better or worse than uh, the geopolitics of the United States and Silicon Valley? I don't think it's worse. But let's not get bogged down into comparing these things. Let's not be caught up in this kind of, of comparison. Now I'm just going to answer Ivana's point about, okay, we don't want vaccination passports, what do we want? Uh, I think that our position must be, after having thought about it a lot and talked to people and form, try to formulate Mera's policy on this, it's fine to ask for negative tests. For negative tests, let's say for the, next, the last 72 hours, uh, with the addition of a rapid test at arrival, on arrival. And why is this okay, whereas the vaccination uh, passport is not okay? Well, because a negative test is a negative test. It doesn't ask you to produce evidence of what's inside of you. It is simply a test that shows that something is not inside you. And it is tr transient. It is useless two weeks later, three weeks later. So, you know, even if it goes on your record and it's in some server in Silicon Valley, who gives a damn whether you were negative, you know, on the 23rd of April 2020, right? Whereas a snapshot of what's inside of you on the 23rd of April 2020 is of huge importance to companies, to the big med, okay? That's why this is my answer to you. Uh, if governments want to expedite travel by asking for a negative test or a twin one, a molecular one, 72 hours uh, uh, before the, the, the travel date and a rapid test on arrival, we are happy with that. But no vaccination record. Thank you. Anyone else? Any closing comments? We're already a few minutes over. Rosemary. You just have to be rather careful with the, the type of negative test that you go for, because in the UK there's been this huge controversy around lateral flow tests, which are being rolled out everywhere in schools and everywhere else, and you can get the results back in half an hour. But the proportion of negative tests that are actually false is high. And yeah, that's why I said the molecular test 72 hours before with a rapid test as an add-on. Yes. Be because the, the type 1 and type 2 errors in the rapid tests that you mentioned are not symmetric. So the chances of you um, coming up positive and not being positive are very small. Yes. The chances of coming up negative while you're positive are very high. Indeed. Indeed. So, that, so that we ended up like, we ended up like a scientific committee in the end. <laughs> if somebody told us one year ago or two years ago, the coordinating collective of DM would be talking about type this, type that, test, rapid test, vaccine, and so on, you would say you are mad. But yeah. You know, the, the, this whole forced me to remember something that I had conveniently forgotten 
that back in 1981, I, I had a degree in, in, in biostatistics from Birmingham University and I did all that. And you know what? I had forgotten about it. it I had tucked it away in some crevice of my mind and it had gone. And now I was reminded. It just took a pandemic to bring it back. <laughs> yep. Okay, um, let's move on to the last topic. We have with us here Dushan, who is the um, coordinator of our Green New Deal for Europe campaign, the umbrella package of radical proposals that we've got in a variety of different areas. He's going to give us a brief, if you can, Dushan, uh, please update, because we've, we've just got uh, a couple of minutes left, um, about what's happening with the campaign and, and what's been going on recently. Of course, Mehran, and thank you. It's basically my honor, first of all, to present you Green New Deal for Europe 2.0, as I, as I call it. We reestablished the structure, we created the new coordination team, and now Green New Deal 2.0 will be presented as it is uh, the real deal, opposed to the Green Deal of European Union, which is neither new or green, as we all know. Additionally, DM's Green New Deal is the only workers-friendly green solution for Europe. And our campaign will be, <clears throat> sorry, will be international, but heavily localized, meaning DSCs are going to be our core units and that we will be focused on change as it should be, uh, bottom up. And we will not be afraid to be too radical. So please keep, both eyes on our social media in the upcoming weeks because we are going for a big relaunch. We will show you how we will tackle social, environmental and climate problems and we are also going to need your help so we are counting on you comrades. Uh, basically we are still in time to realize that we cannot count on prototypical politicians and so-called green initiatives that proved to be only cosmetic in their nature. Only by integrating uh, grassroots activism, civil disobedience, and so on, with the fights in parliaments across Europe, we can build a better future for humans, animals, and the Earth itself. And that's what we will be focusing on in the upcoming time. The Green New Deal is already hand in hand with other DM campaigns like People's Gathering and Campaign Accelerator. And I'm sure our volunteers will be, as I said before, the core units of our campaign. We really need to push this because this is one of the most urgent issues currently for the planet and we don't have the option B. Thank you, Dushan. Wonderful, exciting times. I think we will close it there, the live stream part of our meeting. To you out there, thank you for watching and uh, see you next week, same time, same place.